Well, if you have your copy of the scripture, however you have it, please turn it on or turn in it and go to Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. We're going to be through verse 38 this morning. You know, the list of fears that people have is a long list indeed, and it includes some things for which we are right to be fearful. These are known as constitutional fears or, or those things that make up the human constitution, our, our very being. And one pastor described these kind of fears this way. He said, fear is a normal response to threat. Like pain, it is a gift of God intended to keep us safe. Feeling guilty for feeling fear in a situation of threat is like feeling guilty for feeling hungry when you haven't eaten. It's something your body does, not your will. The challenge is to respond appropriately. And that pastor was serving Christians in Afghanistan. So I suspect he understands a little something about right fear. The Bible also speaks of the fear of the Lord, which we see in Proverbs 9.10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. But what is that kind of fear? What does it mean to fear the Lord? Well, we see an example of this in Hebrews 12, 28 and 29. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. That kind of reverence and awe is what the Bible means when it speaks of the fear of the Lord. We come to him not in a flippant manner, not in a casual way, but we approach him as the God of the universe, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who is our friend, most certainly, but who is God. But then there are what we might call fears of the flesh. These are those superstitious, irrational fears that many of us struggle with. We deal with them. I, I love this little list that I have of these. There's uh, geneophobia. It's the fear of chins. I bet you had no idea that people were afraid of chins, but they are. Uh, allophobia, which is a fear of flutes. Entherophobia, that's the fear of your mother-in-law. And then, of course, there's my personal favorite as well as my daughter's personal favorite, palatophobia. It's the fear of bald people. <laughs> well, Maria Stenvinkel, she's a corporate consultant from Sweden. She did some work and she asked a group of 65 people what their greatest fear in life was. And she got the usual results, right? A fear of dying alone or uh, a fear of, of losing my job. But out of those 65 people, at least 14, 20% of them expressed a different fear, living life without purpose or meaning. Listen to what some of them said. My biggest fear is never taking a risk in an effort to find my true calling. My greatest fear is to go through life living small but not realizing it until it's too late. My greatest fear would be missing out on my purpose here on earth. I know I have a purpose that I am not yet serving. To go through life without leaving a positive mark. And then the last, my greatest fear is regretting all that I didn't do as I lay in my hospital bed as an elderly man. You know, I believe that that fear properly understood and properly responded to is not a bad fear because each one of us has been endued by God with a desire to live our life with impact in this world. And we all want to know how we can have a lasting legacy. We all want to know how we can impact those who we know and who come behind us. But our fears rob us of our initiative to impact the world for Christ. So how can we combat this fear in our lives and live in the peace of Christ? I believe the example of Mary in our passage this morning gives us an example, not only of why fear wells up within us, but how we might overcome it as well and live out our faith boldly. Will you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word this morning? Beginning in the 26th verse of the first chapter of the Gospel of Luke, 
we read, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who is called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this account that we read of your divine messenger, Gabriel, coming to Mary to deliver the news that she was about to conceive and bear a son named Jesus, who was the Son of God. And Father, we know because of his birth, because of the incarnation, you are with us. You have lived the perfect life that we could not. You have endured temptations. You have suffered. You have felt pain. And so you know what it is like to be us. And because of that, you were the perfect sacrifice who could stand in our place, Jesus, and take away our sin. We thank you for this. And now as we study this passage and consider the fears that rob us of that great assurance that we have, I pray that we are able to see how we can overcome them and live boldly the faith that you have given to us by your grace. We ask this for your glory and honor. Amen. Well, before we begin to consider how fear arises within us, let's take just a moment to consider the context of our passage this morning. Luke, the physician and the historian, uh, has written this, this gospel account. And as we saw last week, he wrote it to a man named the Theophilus. And, and he's trying to give an orderly account of all the things that they saw and heard and had been taught. And now he turns his attention away from Zechariah, the priest, to a relative of Zechariah's wife Elizabeth, a young woman named Mary who lived in the town of Nazareth and was betrothed to a man named Joseph. She would have been a very young girl at this point, uh, probably in her early teens. And Nazareth was a very small village in, uh, at this time. In fact, most scholars have pegged the maximum population of this village at about 480 people at this time. It was tiny. It had no significance in the Jewish world. It had no significance in the Roman world, the Greek world, or any other world. It was just an inconsequential village, a backwater nation. That's why Nathaniel, when his uh, brother Philip came to him after meeting Jesus, Replies. He said, I found the Messiah. He's come. He's, it's Jesus of Nazareth. And Nathaniel says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? You see, there was a lack of reputation for this town. But 
it would be in this tiny village to a young girl of no prominence that the plan of God to bring salvation to the world would be made manifest. And so we see in our text this morning that Mary had some fears about this announcement of good news that had been brought to her by Gabriel. And we can learn much from not only what Mary experienced, but also from her response. To start, we see that fear arises when we do not understand God's message. Once again, the angel Gabriel has been sent by God with a divine message. Last week, we saw that he had been sent to Zechariah. This week, he's been sent to Mary. And, and we see that just like Zechariah, Mary is troubled by his presence and by his greeting. You see, look at how he greets her. He says, greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. Now, now here's what we have to understand. This is in Judaism during this period of time for a man to come up to an, a woman that he does not know and greet her would have been scandalous. And not only that, for him to come up and greet a woman who was betrothed to another man would have been seen as a challenge to the fiance. And so this was not usual. But even more unusual is the message that he says. He calls Mary, O oh, favored one. And that word means that Mary is the recipient of grace. She's been filled with God's grace. Now, Mary was a good, faithful Jewish girl. She was following the Lord, and she would have understood that she was not good. She was not deserving of this grace. But here's an angel of the Lord telling her that she has been favored with that grace, and not because of anything that is good within her, not because of anything she has done to earn it, but because it was God's divine choice that Mary would be the recipient of this message. And then, of course, there's the message that she had been chosen to bear the Messiah. And not only to bear the Messiah, but to bear him by a supernatural process. Is it any wonder that we would find her greatly troubled? You see, when we fail to understand God's message, fear rises up within us just as it did in Mary. But it wasn't just the message that caused Mary to fear, it was her inability to understand God's means as well. You see, all faithful Jews would have understood the promise that they remembered from Genesis 3, where God promised that he would, through the seed of the woman, crush the serpent's head. There would be an end to this, this curse when the seed of the woman, the Messiah, would come. And many Jewish girls wondered how God would bring about the Messiah. Many Jewish girls wondered when Messiah would come, and many Jewish girls wondered if they would be the one to bear the Messiah. That would have been the highest honor for any Jewish woman, certainly. And Isaiah had actually told the Jewish people, to all of us, how this would happen. He prophesied that a virgin would conceive and give birth to the Messiah. That was the means by which God had chosen to bring Messiah into the world so that he would be the seed of the woman. But Mary didn't fully understand that. And frankly, not very many other people, if any, understood it either in Mary's time. This was too great for them to comprehend. So when Gabriel tells her that she will conceive and bear a son, Mary cannot understand how this is going to happen. It just doesn't make any sense because she knows the normal means of how babies come into the world. Because she says so, right? She says, how can this be since I'm a virgin? I, I don't know how this is going to happen. But look at how Gabriel explains this in verse 35. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. You see, Mary could not understand God's means, and that brought fear into her heart as well. Now, none of us face the same situation that Mary did. None of us had that message from God. 
But the truth is, many of us still fear, uh, feel fear because we do not understand the means which God is going to use to accomplish something in our life. We face challenges, we face worries and anxieties, and we wonder how God is going to fulfill the promise that he has made to us. And so, we don't know how he's going to deliver, and that experience of uncertainty causes fear in us. The fear continues to build because not only do we not understand God's means, we do not understand God's plan. We know the big contours of the plan, right? Mary did. She understood the big picture. Messiah was going to come. He was going to set his people free. He was going to establish God's kingdom forever. She knew the big picture, but she didn't understand exactly how that was going to work out. Jesus' disciples knew the big picture also, right? They talked about it, and they, they see this throughout the gospel, but their understanding of the plan was limited and skewed by their own desires to see an earthly kingdom of Israel restored and the earthly enemies of, of the Romans defeated. And it's very likely that Mary held to a similar belief, that that's what Messiah would do when he came. And... and if you read Gabriel's message, you could see how that might be interpreted that way. But from where we stand on this side of the cross, we understand that God's plan was even greater than establishing an earthly kingdom and overthrowing the Roman Empire. You see, God's plan was to come and set his people free from sin and death. His plan was to save them from the greatest enemies that exist, not just a temporal enemy who would be here for a season and then be gone. But even knowing all of this, we still struggle with our understanding of God's plan. We see the direction our world is heading, and it doesn't seem like God's kingdom is advancing, does it? It almost seems like it's retreating in some places. Well, brothers and sisters, let me assure you, it is not. As long as people are hearing the gospel, as long as people are believing the gospel, the kingdom of God is advancing and the gates of hell are not going to prevail against it. And so we continue to press forward, but still we don't understand. We wonder about how this is going to happen. And because we don't understand God's plan, we are tempted to adopt strategies and, and trust in powers of this world. We think that there are, are other ways that we can advance the kingdom and we trust in those power structures of the world rather than the power source of God's Holy Spirit. But the more we do, the greater our fears grow because we see the inherent weakness and futility of the world's structures. We see that the government can't save us. We see that religion, self-righteous religion, can't save us. And we become more and more fearful. Well, Mary's response to God's plan for her life reveals not only a lack of understanding of God's means and his plan, but there's also this implicit fear of what others would think about her. She was, after all, only betrothed to Joseph at this point. Their marriage had not yet taken place. It had not yet been consummated. And if Mary were to be found with child, she would be in a situation that would have been utterly terrible for her. There would have been no happy ending at best, Joseph would divorce her and she would be stigmatized as an adulteress. She would have no hopes for any kind of honorable marriage or honorable life. She would be relegated to a life of extreme poverty and there would only be a couple of options open to her for survival. And that's the best case scenario. Because at worst... She would be dragged before the religious leaders, accused of adultery, found to be with child, and she would be executed by stoning. That is what she faced. So is it, we're not surprised 
that Mary might be fearful about what others thought. Now, today, it's highly unlikely that any of us would face a similar scenario. It's, it's unlikely that any of us sitting in here would face death because of what others thought about us and about our faithfulness to Christ. But we're still fearful of that, aren't we? I, I'm reminded of a song that ca came out the year I graduated high school, 1995, by a band named DC Talk. It was a, a, a great song, I love it, um, but what they did is they appropriated what had been an insult given to people in the 60s and 70s, and they turned it into a song of faith and devotion to Christ. The name of that song is Jesus Freak. And the idea, the, the refrain of that song is, what will people think when they hear that I'm a Jesus freak? What will people do when they find out it's true? And then the refrain goes on to say, I don't really care if they label me a Jesus freak. There ain't no disguise in the truth. We won't go into the grammar of it, but we'll say <laughs> that the message is strong because if we were honest with ourselves many times, we are concerned if we're labeled a Jesus freak. We are concerned if people think that we are truly living out our faith. You know, I remember one time when I was teaching, I was sitting in my office and I shared an office with a couple of other people and, and the, the, the other ones came in and they were going off about religious fundamentalists. Uh, those fundamentalist Christians and how terrible they were. And I'm sitting at my desk studying, preparing for class, and I just let them go for a little while. And then I said, you know, I'm a Christian fundamentalist too. And they, what? Not you, Roy. And I, I said, what does fundamentalist mean? I said, if by fundamentalist you mean that I believe the fundamentals of the faith, I believe the virgin birth, I believe the perfect life. I believe the vicarious death. I believe the glorious resurrection. I believe he is coming again. I believe that God is sovereign. Yes, I believe the fundamentals of the faith. Now, if you mean by Christian fundamentalist a hateful person, then no, I'm not that. But let's get down to what the word really means. It means I believe the fundamentals of the faith. And these two women were utterly shocked and they knew I was a Christian, but they had not yet thought about what that meant. They just continued using the pejorative. And I thought to myself, I really don't care what they think about me because I know the one whom I serve. And he is worth it. He's worth whatever insult they may label me with. They can call me a fanatic. They can call me a religious nut job. They can do whatever they want to do. But the reality is that many of us worry about that. We worry about it from our families. We worry about it from our friends. We worry about it from our coworkers or our employers. And so we act more like Peter in the courtyard at Jesus's trial. No, 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 you have me mistaken with somebody else. No, that's, that's another person. Mary had a fear here as well because if she believed the message that God had sent to her from Gabriel and she proclaimed that message, she would be seen in her culture by her family and her friends and the whole village as a fanatic. But finally, I want us to consider one final fear that Mary certainly would have experienced. And it was a fear that originated in her heart because she was more focused on her inabilities rather than God's ability. You see, all these other fears we've considered so far this morning have highlighted the inabilities we all have, Mary included. We have an inability to understand along multiple dimensions God's plan and his, his means and his, his will. And, and we have anxieties about what others think about us. And when we consider the work that God is doing, we realize that we are limited creatures. We are finite. We do not have all the resources. And so when we look at the, the others who are doing the work of God around us, we might think, I don't have the same intellectual 
prowess as somebody like an Albert Moeller or an R.C. Sproul. I, I don't have the oratory of a George Whitfield or an Adrian Rogers. I don't have the faith of a George Mueller or a Lottie Moon. And since we lack in our comparison to these others, we, are, we allow ourselves to believe that we're limited in our usefulness to God. Mary could not see how she could be useful to God she, because she had no status. She had no prestige. She had no wealth. She had no power within her culture. She was a young peasant girl from a tiny backwater village. Who was she? She had no ability. And sometimes we may feel like Mary. We may not understand very well. We may not have the resources others have. But brothers and sisters, that's precisely the type of person that the Lord is in the business of using. Because it is through our inability that his perfect ability is on full display. You see, that is how he works. If it was your ability, if it was what you could do, you could claim credit for it. And some of the glory would go to you and not to God to whom it deserves. That is why Gabriel says in verse 37, for nothing will be impossible with God. You see, when we consider the heroes of the faith, when we consider those, those people that we look up to, that we revere, that we want to emulate, it's not their ability that we admire. It's not their strengths that we try to imitate. It's their faithfulness in the midst of their inability. That is what we strive to follow. It's their willingness to allow the Lord to work through them so that he might receive all the glory. And praise the Lord, that's precisely what we see Mary do in our passage. Because in her response to Gabriel in verse 38, we see how the fear that she had had, it begins to abate, it begins to recede within her. Let's consider how that happened in Mary's response. Notice, first of all, that Mary surrenders herself to God's sovereignty. She says, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. And that word that we translate servant here in the Greek, it is doule, and it means female slave. We use the word servant, it kind of softens the language because in our culture today, talking about being a slave isn't really politic. It, it makes for some uncomfortable conversations. We understand that. But we have these notions in our culture of autonomy, of personal autonomy, personal freedom, personal rights. That's the emphasis that we place on things. And, and so we're unwilling to believe that God would ever impose upon our freedom. We believe that God would never impose upon our autonomy. But did you notice that Mary did not come, or that Gabriel did not come to Mary to ask if she wanted to become pregnant? He doesn't say, I have a great opportunity for you if you're willing to accept it. He says, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. There's not an option there. And think of others in scripture. Wasn't it so respectful of God to respect Jonah's declination of the divine invitation to go to Nineveh? It was so nice of God to say, Jonah, you just go to Tarshish and you can live out your days there in a peaceful way. What about Paul? Wasn't it so nice of God to say, Paul, you could just keep persecuting the church, continue being a Pharisee, that's your personal choice. Or maybe we think of Cyrus in Isaiah 45, 1 through 8. We see God describing the future king of Medo-Persia, and he says about him in that passage that the Lord had named him. The Lord established him as a king, and the Lord set Cyrus apart for his divine purposes. And you know what the most amazing thing about that is? Cyrus wasn't even born yet. Cyrus didn't have a choice in the plan that God had for his life. You see, 
The reality is that the doctrine of God's sovereignty over us can cause some of us to chafe and to bristle, but we have to understand that our disdain for God's authority does not do anything to diminish it. He remains sovereign whether we like it or not. But let me say that God's sovereignty is not intended to make you rebel. God's sovereignty is not intended to make you hate him. It does because of our sinful nature, because we resist it. But God's sovereignty is actually a means of peace to his children because we see that all that happens does so according to his divine will. That does not make God the author of sin. It does not make him the author of evil. But what we do know is that in both his decorative will, which is the decrees that he makes that come to pass, or his permissive will, that which he does not intervene to stop, he is working all things together for his perfect purposes. We won't always understand the reasoning behind God's sovereignty. Indeed, the reality is that we will not understand much of those reasons this side of glory. We won't see how the pieces go together, but what we do understand is that God is good all the time. All the time. And all that he does is both good in and of itself and good for his people. Surrendering ourselves to his sovereignty brings a peace that, as the old hymn declares, uh, it, it understands whatever my God ordains is right. That's a hard thing for us to get to, but it brings a great peace with it. But what's more, Mary submits to God's plan for her. She says, let it be to me according to your word. You see, Gabriel just gave her a glimpse of what's to come. He says, you're going to conceive. You're going to bear a son. You're going to name his name Jesus. He's going to be great. He's going to be exalted as the son of the most high. He's going to be called the son of God. And, and of his kingdom there will be no end because he will sit on the throne of David. But notice that Gabriel does not give her all the details of Jesus' life. He doesn't talk about how there will be three and a half years of itinerant ministry where he goes throughout the countryside without so much as a place to lay his head, not having money, not having resources of his own. Gabriel does not talk about all of the ministry that Jesus will do, the healing of the sick, the casting out demons, and frankly, the ticking off of religious leaders. It doesn't reveal that there will be attempts to take her son's life and that it will eventually be accomplished at the hands of the Romans in the most excruciating, cruel manner that you can imagine. But even if those uh, details of the plan had been shared, Mary would still have gone along with it because she finds peace in submitting to God's plan because she trusts in his sovereignty and his goodness. And I know that for many of us, we wonder what God's plan for us is. Maybe you are nearing the end of high school and, and you're wondering, what does God want me to do? What am I supposed to be doing with my life? Where am I supposed to go? How am I supposed to do this? Others might be about to start a family and they wonder what God has in store for them in terms of their careers and, and children. And still others are preparing to retire and you're curious about God's plan for those years when you don't have to get up every morning and go to work. But here's the reality. We are not always given the specific destination. Sometimes we are called like Abram to go to the place I will show you. And our response is to just take the step in faith and follow wherever he leads. We're not worried about where that may be. It's just taking the next faithful step in following God. And, and we trust that he's going to show us the next one. And I know that sounds like an incredibly frightening way to live life. But brothers and sisters, I can assure you, it provides a peace that surpasses all understanding because we know that God's plan is perfect for us. And it puts us precisely where we ought to be. But in Mary's words here in verse 38, we see that she is also acknowledging God's power. We sang about that. 
She is no longer questioning how will this be. She knows that the infinite power of God will accomplish all that it intends to accomplish. There is nothing in the heavens, on the earth, or under the earth that can thwart his will. There is no power that can stand against him. What or who can stand against our God? Think about who he is for just a moment. He is the God who parted the Red Sea and allowed the Israelites to cross on dry land. He is the one who caused the walls of Jericho to tumble down. He's the one who led Gideon's army of 300 to defeat an exponentially larger enemy force. He is the one who caused the great Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, to eat grass like a wild animal. He's the one who shut the mouths of the lions in the den where Daniel was thrown. And above all, he is the one who raised Christ from the dead and defeat over sin and death. Brothers and sisters, is it any wonder that Paul would exclaim in Romans 8.31, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? We sang about this this morning, and I think it was exactly right. Listen, when you start to fear or feel that fear rise up within you, and it will from time to time, take a moment and begin meditating on those passages of Scripture that speak of God's omnipotence, of his power, of his infinite, perfect power. And that fear will begin to dissipate as you praise him for how he has overcome every obstacle his people have ever faced and how he will overcome the obstacles in your life that you're facing as well. Now, there's many reasons why Mary would be fearful and not the least of which had to do with her family, her fiancé, her friends, and her fellow Jews and how they'd react when they discovered her condition. But one of the ways that she was able to put down that fear of what others thought is by fearing God above all else. And that's that reverence and awe that we spoke about because she turned her focus to the Lord and she was filled with that reverence and awe for him. And that comes, first of all, when we consider who God is. And then, because of who he is, we can see what he has done for us. And, and that's amazing. That's amazing. When Mary surrendered to God's sovereignty, it was done out of that reverence. And, and the same applies to us when we start to meditate on God's omnipotence. We see who he is, and through his power, what he has done. But let me tell you, it's not just our meditations on his power. It's our meditations on all of his attributes, his grace, his mercy, his love, his justice, his kindness, his goodness, his compassion, his holiness. I could go on and on. But as we think about these things, as we turn them over in our mind, as we study the scriptures about them, fear has no place. Fear has no place. And do you know why? Because the perfect love of God in us drives out fear. That's what John writes in his first epistle. And as we are focusing on who he is, we're fearing him over all else. Who can do anything to us when the God of angel armies is on our side. When the Most High is the one we can come to as friend, as father. Finally, Mary's fear abated because she was abiding in his grace. And we've already seen how Mary was the recipient of this abundant grace by God's choice, not because of anything that was in her that was deserving of it, and that's an important distinction for us to make this morning because there are many who have elevated Mary to a place that she herself would certainly have disagreed with. They have made her to be a source of grace. And in this veneration, Mary has come to be seen as the mother of grace. It's the reason why she's the object of, of prayer. But Mary is not the mother of grace She's the daughter of grace. We need to understand that distinction. 
She is not the source from which grace flows. She was the recipient of the grace that flowed from God. And she understood as she heard this message from Gabriel, she understood there's no way I can accomplish this if God's grace does not empower me to do it. Brothers and sisters, whatever God has called you to do, there is no way for you to do it apart from the grace that God will supply to you. But look to Mary. She submitted herself. Behold, I am the servant. I am the slave of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And as we study the rest of Scripture as it speaks of her, she is constantly serving in God's grace. Not because she is a source of it, but because she knows how important it is to receive it. She's not perfect. She doesn't live a perfect life. She's still a sinner, just like you and me. She still had to repent. She still struggled with the flesh. But she knew grace. And that grace drove out fear. And she lived a life that had lasting impact. She lived a life that left a legacy. We all fear that we're going to step out of this world into eternity and, and maybe people won't even remember who we are. Well, I understand that. And if we pour ourselves out for the cause of Christ and nobody remembers us, guess what? You still had a lasting impact. You lived a life with a legacy that could not be greater. Because I assure you, if you're pouring out your life for Christ, if you're living in his grace, you are touching others. It cannot be any other way. And so if that's what you're concerned about this morning, listen. Live for Christ. Live for Christ. All the rest will fall into place. Don't worry about that. God will take care of those things. Leave a legacy of love for him. Leave a legacy that says, I serve him. And because of that, I serve others. But if you're struggling with fear this morning and you don't know him, there's only one hope. And it is faith. Faith in Christ as your Lord and Savior. Otherwise, the fears of this world will just continue to mount up. It will continue to grow. It will continue to crush you. But in Him, in Him and His perfect love, all fear is cast out. So as we sing our final song, I'll be right down here this morning. Will you come and join me? Will you come and, and let me explain to you what it means to let the love of Christ drive out the fear in your life? Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for our time in your word this morning. Thank you that we could come to it and see the beauty that your grace has for, for causing our fear to recede. Father, your grace does so much. This is just one of those things. And Father, I thank you that we can see in your word so many examples of your goodness, of your mercy and grace, of your love, of your patience and kindness and compassion to us. But Father, we also know that some of your other attributes are justice and wrath, and we know that they are directed to all who rebel against you. And so, Father, we pray this morning that if there is anyone here who is living in that rebellion, who has not surrendered their life to you, that today would be the day of their salvation, that today would be the day that they turn away from that and turn to your love and your grace. We ask it for the glory of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.